I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. And Sir Bill Wiggin is in his place. And so we will now come to, with the leave of the House, motion number 12 to 14. And I call on Sir Bill Wiggin to move. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I beg to move. The question is, as on the order papers, may I say aye? Aye. 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 No. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. We now come to motion number 15 on the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs Committee. Not moved. Not moved. With leave of the House, we now come to motions number 16 through to 22. Sir Bill Wigan. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I beg to move the motions in my name. The question is, as on the order, please, may I say aye? Aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. I beg to move that this House do now adjourn. The question is that this House do now adjourn. Kenny McCaskill. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The Eastern HVDC link is a multi-billion pound project, taking up to four gigawatts of clean power from Scotland to England via high-voltage direct current subsea cables. That's enough to power 2.8 million homes in cost and scale. It's the largest electricity transmission investment in the UK's recent history. Two undersea cables will run, one from Peterhead to Selby and another from Torness in East Lothian to Hawthorne Point, County Durham. Preparatory work can already be seen on and offshore in my constituency as a transmission station is constructed and soundings are taken for subsea cabling. What can possibly be wrong with that? For of course it makes sense. Scotland has a surfeit of electricity and power. Scotland has been restored with a great natural bounty already. Almost 97% of Scotland's domestic electricity supply comes from renewable energy. In the north of Scotland, it's been 100% on many days. For all its history, Scotland's geography has been an impediment, distant from markets and with a climate that Scots have more often cursed than blessed. The four seasons in one day, sometimes a reality, not just Billy Connolly's humour. Now, though, location and climate are of great advantage. Scotland is 60% of Britain's onshore capacity and 25% of Europe's potential offshore wind. References to the Saudi Arabia wind largely refer to Scotland or Scottish waters. Those wind assets adding to existing hydro schemes along with tidal and wave projects, still largely to be commercialised. But as with floating offshore wind, concept will become reality. One offshore site alone, Berwick Bank, just one minute, at the mouth of the Firth of Forth between East Lothian and Fife, will provide enough power for almost 3 million households. Scotland only has 2.4 million households. That field alone, providing for all of Scotland's needs, and there are many more. Mr Chairman. Uh, thank the Honourable Gentleman for, for giving way. And ever mindful of the surplus that the Honourable Gentleman referred to, and given that Northern Ireland cannot generate its own electricity, we fully understand the use of sharing and maintaining good connections across the United Kingdom for electricity use. So does the Honourable Gentleman agree that there must be decent and good connect- connectivity across the whole of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and that merits investment UK-wide? We in Northern Ireland deserve equal choice as well. Thank you. Well, I'm sure that the, the Minister will probably concur. I think we are in a, not just the UK, but a European market, as I'll go on to say. Because transmitting the surplus energy sounds sensible, providing the supply required there from the surplus produced in Scotland, also allowing for access to the European network, no doubt Northern Ireland as well. Energy supply, as we've been finding from the Ukraine war, is transnational. Accessing European markets and economic opportunity for Scotland and a necessity for other lands as Putin switches off Russian gas. It also provides for the transition transition all nations require to make as global warming threatens our planet. However, there is a problem. That's grid capacity. Scotland's renewable resource cannot get to market as the transmission system cannot cope with the volume that's produced. As offshore comes on stream, that situation will only worsen. It results in the absurdity of 17.6% of turbines being switched off on an annual basis, the majority in Scotland. Turbines are curtailed, not due to lack of wind, but due to lack of grid capacity. That absurdity is compounded by the perversity that energy suppliers are paid more to switch off than provide power, and rates paid are highest in winter. 
as the House of Commons Library has confirmed that's approaching one billion over the last five years. Debates on the debacle of the privatisation of national infrastructure and the urgent need to provide for battery storage and the opportunities for green hydrogen are for another day. But they are locally based solutions that must be progressed urgently. Simply cabling 40% of the Berwick Bank energy directly south is another. Doing so without any compensatory payment to Scotland is theft of a nation's natural resource, but that too is a debate for another day. What? By all means. Very grateful. And there is huge interest in what we're discussing Darling. in East Anglia because, of course, that's another part of the UK producing an enormous amount of offshore wind. Uh, and I can confirm to him that we would very much like that new capacity to be under sea, not over ground. Yeah. Does he not accept that one of the great benefits of the Eastern Link for Scotland and North of England is protection of the countryside because it's not despoiled by huge overland pylons, as would be the case in East Anglia? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think many would concur to that. I think it's a matter for off, Jim, but no doubt the Minister will, will reply. What's clear is that Scotland's natural bounty and the grid constraints show the need for the Eastern Link. That, in my own constituency, has been chosen is also logical. The site near Turness is on the national grid with the nuclear power station. And it's there and up at coast at Kirkenzie, the site of the old coal power station, again on the national grid where major offshore fields will come ashore. The site in Aberdeenshire has been chosen for similar reasons and destination points in England are near existing power stations. So the project will ease the capacity issues on the existing grid. It's a sensible project and one that everyone should support. Its construction is not the issue. What is at issue is the benefit to Scotland and to communities, both here and south of the border, who should gain from offshore wind. Where's the windfall for Scotland from this natural bounty? Where's the wealth that should flow along with the energy from this vital resource? Where's the benefit for those communities, such as my own, which will be able to see the turbines on their hills and off their shores? Scotland is energy rich, yet Scots are fuel poor. It's no comfort to those unable to heat their homes in my constituency that they may see the turbines turning, either on or offshore. Indeed, that just adds insult to injury. Where's the payment for or financial compensation for our renewable energy, being taken south or even sold abroad? Where's the jobs in Scotland and its communities from the industry that should follow, never mind the supply chain to maintain it? Where's the businesses that should be locating next to this clean and cheap energy, along with the technology for it and springing from it. Of course, this isn't Scotland's first natural bounty. There was an earlier one in the 1960s and 70s. That was Scotland's oil and gas. As the Macron report commissioned by a British government showed, Scotland should have been one of the richest countries in Europe. No wonder they hid it. For across the North Sea, Norway likewise accessed that bounty. She's prospered and now has a sovereign wealth fund for future generations that Scotland can only look at and weep. Our blessing was used by Thatcher to smash the trade unions and by Blair to wage war in Iraq. Yeah. The oil and gas remain, though transition we must. What remains, and that can be used, must benefit the Scottish people. But that too is a separate debate. But what it shows, and why it's relevant to this debate, is that we've been blessed once again. But we mustn't lose out this time. The Eastern Link project is sensible and required, but it must benefit Scotland. The turbines that are coming off our shores should see our current yards vibrant and almost every estuary in Scotland utilised for their construction. Yet by far and Arnish lie dormant and works going south or abroad, whether they're the Netherlands or even Indonesia. That's simply unacceptable and with energy policy largely reserved, the UK Government must take the blame. But that's compounded by the Scottish Government's incompetence in the Scotland auction. Their Scottish fields have been sold off cheap, netting £700 million, while New York garnered $4.3 billion for a quarter of what was on offer in Scotland. Those mistakes can and must be reversed, yeah. but the Eastern Link project's in danger of compounding that. Where's the wealth, jobs and businesses? Where's the payment for the resource being transmitted south? What cash has been received or compensation made for the asset taken? It seems that the payment to the Scottish Government amounts to precisely zero. Nothing's been paid in either regular payments or even in a lump sum. 
The only payment will be a very modest remittance to Crown Estate Scotland for the cable landing on the foreshore. A few bobbies to Scotland is hardly what Saudi Arabia or Norway receive for their natural bounty. That's nationally. But what about locally? Where's the payment that should accrue to East Lothian and to other communities, both north and south of the border, from the offshore wind coming ashore? The only area that really benefited from Scotland's discovery of oil was Shetland. There, payments from oil and gas coming into Sulem Vaux were negotiated by the Islands Council. It was largely down to one man, the Council Chief Executive Ian Clark. It wasn't a huge figure, and it certainly wasn't a disincentive for investment, but the funds it produced allowed Shetland to flourish, able to provide facilities that even larger mainland councils could only look at and envy. Public and sports facilities in small communities, ferry and bus services operating from early to late, local schools staying open or even expanding. That's how it should have been with oil and gas across all of Scotland. It must be how it will be in communities where the second natural bounty is arriving. The benefits for Shetland from oil and gas must be available from offshore wind in East Lothian, Yorkshire, East Anglia, wherever it's landing. Chief executives and authorities like my own would love to replicate Mr Clark, but they can't. The reason being that whilst there's legislative provision for community benefit for onshore wind farms, there's no equivalent for offshore. That needs fixed. It needn't be a sum that would discourage investment, but it would still benefit communities significantly. It should be levied on the producers and paid to local authorities, set by government and subject to review, allowing for standardisation of rate and for production, cost factors and energy prices to be factored in if required. Of course, energy providers do make voluntary payments to local communities, but the right to community benefit should be statutory, not discretionary, nor should it be capable of being used by the companies for pet projects or simply increasing their profile. Why? That's why it should accrue to the local authority allowing them, as in Shetland, to benefit the entire area, not simply a few communities or certain organisations. For it's essential that offshore wind benefit local communities, north and south of the border, as well as Scotland. Where also are the jobs in these communities that should be flowing from this bounty? As with the turbines, they're largely heading south or abroad. The construction contracts for the transmission station have gone to big corporates and local business and labour are excluded. Filling a few hotel rooms or hiring a few security guards shouldn't be the only work available locally in East Lothian from this bounty. And what about the businesses that should be locating where energy is flowing ashore and where it should be an incentive to locate and indeed common sense to locate? They too seem to be heading south where the energy is arriving. There will be only four permanent jobs at the transmission station at Tornes. That's perhaps understandable, but what about the businesses that should be opening and clustered near it? It's why battery storage and hydrogen projects mentioned earlier are essential, as is ending the absurdity of higher energy prices being levied where the energy is being produced here in Scotland. Scottish businesses should be booming, not constrained by higher energy costs. Jobs should be flourishing across Scotland, especially in the communities where the energy is landing. This looks remarkably like our bounties being taken, with no payment being made, let alone benefit accruing to our country or communities. In summary, Mr Deputy Speaker, the Eastern Link project deserves support, but there must be compensation for Scotland for the energy flowing from it, as there must be benefit from the communities where it lands. Following on from its first natural bounty in oil and gas, Scotland has been blessed with a second in offshore wind. It's essential that our country and our communities now benefit from it and that we don't get fooled again. Here, here. Minister. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And let me begin by congratulating the Honourable Gentleman, the Member for East Lothian, for securing this important debate today. Uh, this government is leading the world on offshore wind. We have the most installed capacity in Europe. In our energy security strategy, we aim to go much further 
with an ambition of 50 gigawatts of offshore wind and 5 gigawatts of floating wind by 2030. And Scotland, as the Honourable Gentleman will know and has indeed set out, has a vital part to play. And there are many green jobs um, uh, around uh, that work in Scotland. Um, I'll give way to the Honourable Gentleman. I, I thank uh, the Minister for giving way. Um, it's simply not. A, 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 that that, that uh, suggestion doesn't stand up, actually. Um, the uh, organisation Scottish Renewables uh, have frequently told me that the best that Scottish people can hope for from the renewable uh, um, boom is to become service engineers for heat exchangers. That's simply not good enough. There are no meaningful jobs in construction or indeed in offshore maintenance in my constituency, which looks out at the sea green uh, development off the Fife coast. So that assertion does not bear out in the facts or the numbers. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Well, I have a, a, a lot of offshore wind off my constituency as well. It, it, it'd be, I mean, what we've done with the CFDs uh, and the leading the world in the deployment of offshore wind has been tremendous for increasing the renewables, um, transforming the economics of offshore wind, not only domestic benefits, but in fact global benefits. Um, and there have been a lot of jobs. But actually, I, I, I share with the Honourable Gentleman a feeling that given the global leadership we've had, have we... Uh, managed to create as many jobs, as much of the industrial capability and indeed community benefits uh, as we would like. And I leave that question in the air. I, my feeling is that uh, the expansion of offshore wind and indeed the uh, coming hydrogen, carbon capture and all these other technologies, that what we've got to do is not just deploy um, at the lowest cost but actually capture the wider value in the right way that balances and gives the best possible value for our, for our constituents. Um, Scotland is home to high wind, Scotland and Kincardine, the world's first and largest commercial floating uh, wind farms respectively. And Scotland's plentiful supply of stormy skies holds vast promise. The Scotland Crown Estate's recent Scott Wind licensing round kick-started 20 new projects, totalling around 28 gigawatts of installed capacity, a frankly enormous figure. Um, and this is all sterling stuff, but increasing our renewable energy capacity is key for delivering on our net zero 2050 target, something which I'm sure both honourable gentlemen would strongly support. But it's also crucial for guaranteeing security of supply in a time where Putin's appalling invasion of Ukraine threatens to drive up prices and drive down thermostats. Because wind energy isn't just renewable, it's secure and increasingly affordable too. But installed capacity is only one part of the story. One of the challenges we have to address is how to get the electricity we are generating to the households who need it. And the stakes are high. It's not just households, it's schools, hospitals and businesses too. Right now there are significant network constraints between Scotland and England. And no matter how many kettles are boiling across Yorkshire, uh, when the network is at full capacity, Scottish renewable energy generation, as the Honourable Gentleman laid out, has to be curtailed. And with more projects coming online each year, it's all the more vital that we transform our electricity network to unlock Scotland's potential. That's why transmission links on the East Coast joining our two countries are so crucial, particularly for projects like Berwick Bank off the coast of the Honourable Gentleman's constituency in East Lothian, with connections in both England and Scotland. In July, Ofgem approved two of these links in their final needs case, one between Torness, East Lothian and Hawthorne Pitt, County Durham, and the other between Peterhead, Aberdeenshire and Drax in North Yorkshire. The, the, these links will ensure that before 2030, no Scottish renewable energy potential will go to waste and they will reduce any potential constraint costs caused by limited capacity. I can wait to my well, I am uh, very yeah. grateful. Um, the fact is, these two connections, the Eastern Link, will cost £3.4 billion and carry four gigawatts. Now, at the same time, National Grid is insisting in going, on going ahead with pylons from Norwich to Tilbury, which will despoil our countryside. They refuse to consider offshore alternatives. We had to force them kicking and screaming to look at options, and they finally come up with a cost assessment, which is for six gigawatts, not the four gigawatts on the Eastern Link, but for six gigawatts, it would cost 3.1 billion undersea, which is less than the Eastern Link. Why aren't we going to get the same sort of investment in East Anglia, given the huge delivery we're giving from offshore wind? Yeah. Well, my honourable friend, I know, is, uh, is truly expert in this, in this area and working with colleagues is working very hard to ensure that these arguments are heard and the case is made 
um, uh, uh, to ensure that minimum disruption for the maximum facility and benefit uh, is brought in to his constituency and those around him. Um, the Government is working closely with Ofgem, the independent regulator and industry, to ensure our electricity network is ready to harness the power of renewables to deliver for consumers. And our approach is threefold. Firstly, we are working to ensure transmission infrastructure is planned in a coordinated way. And in July, the energy systems operator published the holistic network design. This is the first ever strategic plan for the infra infrastructure needed to bring energy from offshore wind onshore. And the streamlined approach will reduce the cost of construction for networks. It also means lower bills for families, including in Scotland. Consumers will save £5.5 billion in costs from 2030 over the network lifetime. And by reducing the amount of infrastructure required, it will minimise disruption to communities and the environment too. But we're not just changing the way we build, we're speeding things up as well. The Government is committed to reducing end-to-end timescales for the construction of transmission infrastructure by three years. To get to this goal, we've appointed Nick Windsor as the Network's Commissioner to review the development process to identify where it can be made faster. And Ofgem recently consulted on speeding up regulatory approvals of network projects, and we expect them to publish a decision later this year. Officials in my department are working with those in the Department for Leveling Up Housing and Communities to reduce planning time frames as well. And we'll consult on how communities should best benefit from hosting grid infrastructure in their local area. So we're making the way we do things now smarter and faster, but we're also exploring new solutions to storage, which the Honourable Gentleman mentioned, which promise to alleviate capacity constraints. Of course, I'll give way. Well, would the Minister accept that there is a difference between how community benefit is dealt with with regard to onshore and offshore wind, which I can only assume came about through a failure to appreciate that wind would ever go offshore? But I wonder whether you are prepared to meet with myself and representatives from Heath Lordling and perhaps even Aberdeenshire to discuss how we may accrue some benefit from that offshore energy that currently applies to onshore only? Well, like the honourable gentleman, I have a vision of us contributing to and leading the world as we are, but continuing that up to 2030 and beyond, greening um, our, uh, our energy supplies and our whole society, but developing. Um, as I mentioned, the industrial capability, but also the benefits, if we can, coming up with a holistic system which brings the maximum benefit and thus carries everybody with us. Every community should be proud to host this, but should also benefit from it. I'd be delighted to meet with the Honourable Gentleman um, were I to continue in this role, um, and he can try and hold my successor if I don't um, to that. But I, I think, it, I, I think the, the Honourable Gentleman has made a very powerful case um, and quite reasonably uh, is looking to do the right thing. One of the uh, most genuinely exciting technologies in this area is long duration storage. This, as the name might suggest, stores electricity when it is not needed by users, and then releases it slowly over time when demand is higher than generation. And that could enable us to reduce costs by maximising our consumption of cheaper domestic renewable generation, enabling a more efficient seasonal balancing of the system. And there's a real chance here to save tens of billions of pounds, tens of billions, between 2030 and 2050. And we can make sure those Scottish storms keep Yorkshire's kettles warm in winter, and hopefully within a system which benefits all. To do so, the Government is developing policy to secure investment by 2024, and with this investment we will be able to deploy enough long-duration storage to balance the whole UK system. We are moving full speed ahead to deliver a clean, secure and affordable energy supply for all. Today's debate, Mr Deputy Speaker, has highlighted the critical importance of infrastructure for achieving the same and ensuring that all communities, those who host, who are near to the energy production, the transmission, that their interests are understood are met and that all can feel positive about the outcome of this uh, world-leading effort that we are collectively making in England, Scotland and the other parts of this United Kingdom. Thank you. The question is that this House do now adjourn. Say aye. Aye. Now I think the ayes have it.